Hello and welcome to the third podcast where we talk about this, that, and the third. I am your host, Kai Marie, and I'm here with my co-host, Aaron. Hola. Hey, Aaron. <laughs> How you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm doing de- I'm doing well. We're holding it down for Brandon this evening. Shout out to Brandon. He couldn't be with us, but I'm super excited. Kai, you already got this pretty good. So you the new engineer. We're gonna fire Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Let's see how well we get through this. Brendan may send us some messages while we're in this uh, episode. Like, so what are y'all doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But shout out to Brandon and the family. He had some prior obligations, yeah. but um, we are super excited because you guys know we try to talk about as many black topics as possible that are going to be constructive and make an impact on our community and help us make some progress. And tonight, we have some really, really special guests, and we. <sighs> I don't, I'm so excited. I don't even know what to do with myself because one of my favorite topics is Black history and people that have had an impact just in general as uh, Black Americans in this country. And we have two, I call them top five that are alive, two of the best historians in this part of the world, none other than my man history before us, Mr. Frederick Murphy. And then I got to make sure I get it right. Miss Patterson, Dion Patterson, aka Conductor D. How you guys doing this evening? Hey everybody. Hey, what's up, everybody? Doing good, brother. Doing good. How are y'all feeling? Doing great. Doing great. Good. Doing good. Excited for tonight. Nice. Nice. Cool. Good deal. So I want to get right into it, but before we get started, I'd like you guys to uh, introduce yourselves. Just give us a little bit of background. So, Conductor D, tell us about your projects how you got into your space and uh, just why you have such a passion for history. Okay. Um, So I'm Dion Patterson, also known as Conductor D. And um, I got that title from guiding people on the Underground Railroad. That's what we call people who led people to freedom was a conductor. Um, So I do tours that range from days to just, you know, a mile or two. And then I also provide seminars and education workshops and um, forum speaking, art galleries, anything underground railroad and um, the history of slavery. Um, a lot of people say like, why would you want to st- study such a sad topic? But it's not just studying a sad topic. It's studying the people who are lesser known, who have yeah. those powerful stories of resilience and faith and resourcefulness. And we're going to talk about some of that tonight. So thanks for having me. I'm super excited. Oh, absolutely. We're super excited. I mean, Fred is already Fred already gave me a few gems about the railroad. So I'm I'm just, I'm just like geek right now. I'm just like geek right now. But yo, know, Mr. Murphy, tell us about your projects and uh, your passion for history and how you got into it. Yeah, so uh Frederick Murphy, Frederick Deshaun Murphy, uh founder of History Before Us, uh documentarian as well as licensed clinical mental health therapist. <clears throat> and uh, you know, history was was an was an escape for me. Uh, as it relates to taking a break from being um, just overworked from a therapy standpoint. So I was constantly telling people to do self-care, but I was neglecting it myself. And I had to identify what it was that, what self-care looked like for me, right? And for me, it was literally collecting oral histories, being in that space to where I can uh, glean uh, information, education, and put it out on a platform that um, is appeasing to the eye, uh, working to get better and better at it and bringing stories that individuals may not necessarily know about. And uh, that's exactly what what Dee does as well with her work. And, and hopefully I do my job in doing that as well. And uh, one other thing that, that Dee failed to, to mention, I don't think we've talked about it often, but um, I also run some Facebook live shows on history before us and Dee was a guest And uh, afterwards, we were just talking about genealogy and stuff like that. And um, she's also a certified genealogist. Um, So she didn't say that. So, you know, I'm I'm (laughs) going to pat her back. At giving credentials. I know. I know. I am too, right? (laughs) It's it's, it's a thing to do because that's just who we are as as Black folks, right? Uh, Unless you're Kanye. Uh, But I had to throw that in there. Yeah, I know. know. It was (laughs) His name going to come up, but that's the only right, right, <laughs> right, right. But, um, but we found out later via DNA tests that we're actually related. Uh, we matched on three different oh, chromosomes. Wow. It's crazy, right? And so uh, we are actually related. And after that, it was like, all right, cool. Like, 
we got to keep working together now. Uh, so, yeah, so that's actually a, a relative of mine. A newfound awesome. relative. Newfound relative. Yeah. Look, by the end of the look, D, he, look, he, he boosted you up so good. By the end of the show, you're going to find my great great aunt Sheila, <laughs> 18, 22, you know? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Those man. stories can be found. A lot of Black people get discouraged because, yeah. you know, we're made to feel like, and our, our history was scattered, but we can find it. And there mm -hmm. are tools and resources out there. Yeah, I love that you said that because that's so true. We feel like we don't have roots. And I think through the work that you're doing shows that no, we do have roots. Here's where they are. And this is how we can start connecting those pieces. And that's so important, I think, not only for us to know our history, but in the healing process as well. So I'm so happy with the work that you that you both are doing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. So, you know, D, we the the, the ancestors is flowing right now. Because Dee mentioned the first word, and I wrote it down, and she said resilience. Mm -hmm. And so many people in today's, in just today's time, when they think about slavery, when they think about Reconstruction, even when they think about the Civil Rights uh, Movement or anything of that nature, the picture that they get in their brains of Black people is just standing around and doing absolutely nothing, if we're telling the truth. Because you may or may not have had the quote unquote progress that some other group has, but let's be real. Some of those other groups were promoted and a lot of those groups and those people are not treated in the anti-black way that black people are in this country. So we have to be honest about that. So the first thing I wanna talk about, and I think the best example of resilience is the Underground Railroad. And Frederick, you were talking to me something about some of the things I didn't even think about, which was the infrastructure and the resources. So, D, this is your bag. I want you to get right into it. Talk to us about talk to us about how intricate, but also how incredible the Underground Railroad was, because that's a part, you know, people see, you see a Harriet movie and you hear a couple of things and then they're like, oh yeah, we had the Underground Railroad and Harriet had a gun. And if you didn't run and th th like, those are the stories. But I'm Kai and everybody, our listeners are smart enough to know there are some intricacies about this Underground Railroad that go beyond our imagination. So talk to us specifically about it could even be the start, the infrastructure. Just tell us why this was so important to our people in that, in that day and time. OK, so the first thing I'll say is that let's just clarify that the Underground Railroad was not a route. It was <laughs> a very, like you said, intricate secret network that was international. Mm. It was, it included Quakers, yes, but Black folks were the main player. They were just right. a part of the cast. We were, you know, we were the lead players of that. And so you had free African-Americans who were assisting on the Underground Railroad. You had Quakers, you had indigenous people who were leading folks through bogs and marshes. And you also had a variety of different other Caucasian people who were helping who were not Quakers. Mm. Um, the Underground Railroad included not just route, routes, but waterways. It included train rides. There were people who had wagons. Frederick and I had an opportunity to view what was it? The only authenticated or uh, false bottom false wagon. wagon. Yep. Yeah. Well, actually, there's there's two. There, there were two. only two. Yep. Yeah. So we saw one of them, and the false bottom wagon looks like someone is just carrying hay or pottery, but then there's a secret compartment underneath where people would hide. All right. So you have all these routes and all these systems, and then you have this influx of helpers. So they were called a number of different things underground railroad agents, engineers, conductors, station masters, um, engineers, agents, they were all just workers, right? Those were synonymous, but a conductor was someone who guided people to freedom. Hmm. And those were people who may have said, these are the directions, this is the way to go, or they may have physically taken them there. There was a black underground conductor, Severn Johnson from Wilmington, Delaware, who didn't just show people the way to go, but he got on the train with them and then rode with them, took them to the doorfront of William Still, another free African-American conductor and station master. 
uh, a station master was someone who opened up their home or they opened up their meeting house or their church or their restaurant uh, store. There were a number of places that were hiding places. So a station was a safe house, but it wasn't literally always a house. And the, the goal was to provide medical care. Um, people were arriving with gunshot wounds. People had infections. There were folks who were dehydrated and sick. And of course, hypothermia, um, hunger, all of that was, was a reality. So all of this took an extreme amount of funds, right? Because we know you can't get on a train for free, even right. in the 1800s. Even back then. <laughs> who were guiding people to freedom, secret and folks on their boat. They wanted to be paid. People who were chauffeuring others to the doorstep, they were expecting their cut too. And then another really important piece to consider was the fact that when you came from the South, you were wearing clothes of the South. So your en enslavement clothes were made from this horrible material. And I'm speaking about the 1800s. Right, right. The 1700s was a different deal. That when they left on the underground, they were taking their wigs and their shoes with buckles and velvet vests and all this other kind of stuff. That changed in the 1800s to enslaved people being given material, one outfit, and that one outfit was typically made out of a material called toe fabric, which was used for two purposes. One was to stuff upholstery, mm -hmm. and the other was to make enslaved people's clothing. Mm -hmm. And it was an extremely poor quality, really rough, abrasive, scratch your skin off abrasive um, material. So you could not come to the North wearing those clothes. You had to assimilate. You had to have um, clothes that fit, you know, because you could get your clothes a year ago and you're working from before the sun came up to after the sun went down every day. Those clothes were not holding up so great. So there were a lot of financial needs on the Underground Railroad. Groups of 17, 29 people would sometimes show up. If this is, you know, my family of five and now we have to supply food for 29 people, mm -hmm. that takes money. Mm -hmm. Right. And contrary to what a lot of people think, there was a range of variety of times that people length of times that people would stay at these safe houses. So mm. you had some folks who were there for hours. They had to get them moved on to the next location. And then there were others where it's winter, like we can't travel or there are a lot of patrollers in the area. So some people stayed for months mm. at a time. People were buying freedom. For folks on the Underground Railroad, getting people off the auction block, freedom papers, all the lawyers, uh, um, lawyer fees, all of this was an expense. So then you had the um, organizations that funded and supported the Underground Railroad. And there were so many, I couldn't even name them all. They were a um, couple of examples, the American Vigilance Committee, pretty much every free state had their own anti-slavery committee. And then some had the Women's Anti-Slavery Committee, and some had the um, the Men's Anti-Slavery, the American Anti-Slavery. And so this was a really busy network that entailed a lot of correspondence back and forth, not just um, within the United States, but also overseas. Wow. So, so that's the Black Lives Matter before Black Lives Matter, right? That's right. Wow. So, yeah. <clears throat> so you mentioned something in... You said 1700s. Yes. So the infrastructure of the Underground Railroad dates back to the earliest date of what? Mid 1700s, you can read want ads of people running away and enslavers saying they got assistance from so and so and so. Mm -hmm. I think they went this particular route. So, yes, the Underground Railroad was in place in the 1700s. However, it wasn't until the 1800s that it was named and all these organizations and support um, and the, um, like I said, the organization of it all changed in the 1800s to the point where this was so tight that we knew if you went to this person's house, then you, we were gonna forward you to this place and, and so on and so forth. Gotcha. So before Kai has a question, so my, my, my automatic thought is, how did these people operate this infrastructure? 
have this thing flowing and have so much success under the direct guise of racism, white supremacy at that time. Because obviously that was a threat. Um, let's be clear, obviously some of the slaveholders knew it. I'm assuming some of the federal government knew it. How were they able to continuously run this operation and infrastructure without, we know the powers that be coming in to try to destroy the infrastructure, the money? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so first I'll say it wasn't flawless. There were a number of people who lost their homes. They lost finances. There mm. were a number of um, free African-Americans who lost their freedom helping other people. There were Caucasian people who were branded SS for slave stealer. Um, and they lost, like I said, they lost everything that they had. So there were a lot of people who went to jail for long periods of time. Um, but the bottom line was there was just no, there were no excuses. Mm. Now people make excuse stuff, right? But back then it was like, this is what we're going to do. And we're not going to fearlessly, we're going to just do this. And so there was a lot of correspondence between the conductors. Um, William Still's book, The Underground Railroad, is an excellent uh, mm -hmm. book, book to read to help people to understand the intricacies of the Underground Railroad. You see letters saying, I'm going to forward this person to you. Um, sometimes they wouldn't say, they actually wouldn't say the person's name. They would say, I'm going to forward um, some folks to you. But then there were some other people who used code words. Oh, okay. Okay. Send, um, mm -hmm. Some hams your way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I hope that you'll be able to receive these hams. They should arrive tomorrow night mm -hmm. in large quantities. Um, there were also other code words that they used as well. Um, so they had to have really good communication. I'm, it always blows my mind how well they were able to communicate without cell phones because word would get to people so quickly. <laughs> Imagine that. Right. I mean, and the other thing, too, is that people stay committed. Mm. I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be in this spot at this particular time. You don't have to question whether or not I'm going to be there. Am I going to show up? Is I'm, Am I going to say, I'm sorry, I was tired after work. I didn't get a chance to. No, the things that we hear today, you just didn't really hear on the, mm. on the underground back then. People right. were committed to to the cause under the constant threat of terrorism every single day. Every Constantly, single day. but you know what? A lot of those Underground Railroad conductors were fearless. Yeah. They were absolutely fearless. They were equipped, contrary to what people may think, a lot of them were locked and loaded. Come to my house if you want to. Right, 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 mm -hmm. right. right. No, was no, it I'm sorry, black? go ahead. No, 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 I, I, I was gonna ask her, um, the conductors, was it majority black men, black women? Was it a mixture or? So it was majority black and there was a mixture of um, men and women. We hear more about the men. Right. But the other way to look at it is any man who was involved in secreting people in the house, the woman was involved too, right? Yeah. So, Go ahead, Brett. Um, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that D and I were talking about, you know, being that, you know, obviously I'm in the mental health field and to a certain degree, the, the capacity in which D works also deals with the same thing. And one of the things that we talked about as it relates to historical trauma from a mental health and a holistic health standpoint is think about the mental anguish that individuals had to consistently be under having to trust every person that you see, having to uh, re realize that anybody could have been a patty roller, right? right. Like we know that there were some indigenous folks that were guiding for, uh, uh, freedom seekers throughout the swamps and things like that, but some of them were also hunters, right? A lot of these indigenous folks were slave hunters, right? Because they knew the, 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 the land so well. And so just imagine constantly having to be on that threat all the time, right? Serotonin levels through the roof, right? Like you're just mm -hmm. constantly under this threat of not knowing who to trust, not knowing um, if you'll see your people again, or if you're walking right into a trap, right? And so when we talk about our DNA and what's deeply embedded in our DNA, yeah, this person may have made it to freedom, but that doesn't mean that the trauma left them because look at what they had to go through for potentially right. six months to get that. Yes, right? the, at a at a much higher level of of risk 
to a certain degree because of the simple fact that they're on the run versus someone who potentially stayed. And this is not to compare at all on no. the station. And um, they know essentially what their day is going to look like day in and day out. And as long as they did what they're supposed to do, then physically they can be cool. Right. But, you know, emotionally, of course, with the selling of families and things like that, you can be scarred. But, you know, ultimately, there's a lot of uh, monotony with your day. For a person that's on the Underground Railroad, you don't know what's going to (laughs) happen. Right. And so uh, we talked about things. uh, Her and I talk about things all the time and, and think about how far back mental health goes for black black folks that are dealing um that have dealt had to deal with those types of circumstances right yes yeah. yeah. we have um oh yep yeah. uh vc saying no telling who they had to kill to stay free uh so could you tell us a little bit about that too is about what they endured while on this journey you said that they're caring for protection uh what were some of the, the things that they encountered um while they were en route to their freedom So to Frederick's point, there were indigenous people who they couldn't trust, but unfortunately there were also African-Americans that they could not trust. There were a whole lot. This is the other thing too. The Underground Railroad and um, turning people in was a business. It was a financial business. Mm -hmm. People who were looking for some money, whether it be to just get ahead or for survival, there were people of every race who were interested in getting the getting those uh, ransoms, so you have a, a bounty of six people. Thomas Otwell was the biggest snitch in Delaware. Um, he's known <laughs> all throughout history as being the scoundrel from Delaware. You know this conductor that Harriet Tubman trusted so well, and then he turned his back on um, the, the Dover Eight, is what they're called, mm. and so. Um, you know, you had those kinds of situations, not knowing who to trust. But then you also had people who had a lot of close calls. So here you are, you know, at night. So your your brain is already in fight or flight. Right. Mm-hmm. And they say that during fight or flight, the whole problem solving part of the brain shuts down. But African-Americans, we defied all of that because we were able to process backup plans at the last minute. We were able to um, remember directions. And if you've ever walked in the woods at night, can you imagine trying to remember which way to go? And you're also knowing that you, you're being hunted physically. Wow. So some of those close calls involve people being shot at and getting shot. Not like I escaped the bullet, yay, I can go. I mean, people were arriving with broken limbs People were sick. Some people lost their children along the way and they still had to persevere. And then imagine going into somebody's house. You're not really certain if they're going to turn their back on you or not. Just the fact alone that you have you've already been traumatized in slavery. Now right. the Underground Railroad, though it is a, a portal to freedom, it also is traumatic. Can you imagine all the panic attacks Waking up in mm. cold sweats, stomach aches, vomiting. Ellen Craft, when she arrived to Philadelphia, was so sick from that thousand miles to freedom that she couldn't travel. She was in bed for three days straight. Yeah. Yeah. And that same trauma mm-hmm. gets passed down through the generations, just like our hair color, our eye shape, and everything else. Emotions are not any different. So when we talk about reparations and people saying things like, oh, it, you, should, you should be over that. That happened how many years ago? Um, hello. I still have a taste for something sweet like my old auntie from the 1800s. Right. And I still <laughs> suffer different fears and um, yeah. traumas from those experiences. And I think what made it real to me, um, the DNA, was when I was looking for one of my relatives who was a freedom seeker. And I was trying to find, um, you know, the background, what was the story and started getting involved with DNA and so on and so forth. And I looked at this screen that had all these different components of chromosomes and the layout of the DNA. And it really was a visual for me that, you know, we always say, and it's very cliche, well, the ancestors are with us. No, literally they are with us. Mm. I say. 
That's right. I, I, I say, wow, that that was powerful. And uh, as Kai, as we know, it, even back in the 1800s, they was collecting them butter biscuits. So Thomas was, was getting were. them butter biscuits. Yep. They, he was collecting them. He got a lot. Mm -hmm. And you know what? One other real quick component to that is think of the landscape back then. Yeah. Like we're talking 1700s, 1800s. We're talking about a much smaller population of people, but a much larger population of animals. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We're talking wolves. We're talking bears. We're talking <laughs> alligators. We're talking coyotes. We're talking real deal wildlife. Mm -hmm. So you're not only um, also hoping to survive the Underground Railroad and the paddy rollers and the people that can potentially turn you in, but you're also not trying to be dinner either. Right. And, right. and uh, I read um, a narrative um, about this gentleman who was attacked by a wolf when he was escaping, right? Because, again, the landscape is full of trees. There weren't roads, right? And so these individuals, uh, like Dee had mentioned, had to depend on instinct or other individuals that were going to be truthful with them, invested in their freedom in order for them to be able to bypass all of these things and wild animals included. So that's just another uh, element that individuals had to, to deal with. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. They, they're not just hopping on I-95 and getting no. in there <laughs> and getting in <laughs> Camry and driving up the road. Right. Nope. Nope. Animals were real. <laughs> Wow, wow, that is wow. That's even just hearing that information about the constant threat. Um, obviously, today in today's time, there is still a threat, but the the level of, like you said, environmental, economic, um, j just the direct terrorism was a lot different then. Uh, we still have problems, and we're not doing a comparison, but it, it don't take a fool to say that those circumstances then were extremely hostile and extremely dangerous on a daily basis, but the determination and the resilience, again, the resilience of these people to fight. And I think the one thing that I think as a community that we sometimes don't think about the Underground Railroad, but we should, was that the Underground Railroad was also a form of direct revolt. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just think about direct revolt as in represent, did we have guns? And no, 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 no. Having a constructive plan to mm -hmm. escape is another form of re of revolt and resilience. That's right. You know, we just had so many different creative ways, and still do as a community that we could we can definitely learn those lessons. So, shout out to Conductor D for sharing that information, and and you guys are rocking. Now, we've got two individuals that you guys wanted to discuss. I wrote their names down, and so we want to get into it. And these are both black men that from an economic and political landscape, we're probably doing things that, I think at some point you probably would, could argue, still haven't been seen to this day, um, basically, based upon their circumstances. And I'm not comparing times, but economically, politically, these gentlemen, and I just did a little bit of research, it was, it's incredible. So I want you, uh, uh, Mr. Murphy, Mr. History, you know, we're gonna talk about Mr. William Whipper and Mr. James Fortin, and who you want to start with? So uh, D is way more knowledgeable in this area, right? And oh, okay. so, yeah. So, so, but, 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 but I, I do know I've, I've been to <laughs> I've been to Fortin's home in Philly. Like I've been, I've researched it. But this is really her. This is her niche, right? And what I am going to follow up with is individuals during Reconstruction from okay. a political standpoint. And then the beautiful children who spawned from those individuals and these uh, individuals who've been able to create black wealth in various different communities across the United States after uh, and during uh, Reconstruction. So um, I'll let Dee jump in and, and discuss those two brothers and then I'll follow up with those folks because it's really, really amazing the difference, um, the different circumstances in which individuals had to create economic prowess in order for us to be well. Fantastic. Yeah. Ms. D. Okay, so William Whipper was a free African-American businessman. Um, he owned a lumber yard in partnership with another free African-American who was wealthy named Stephen Smith. Stephen Smith 
um, had multiple properties. Um, he created this, built this home for the aged, but he and William had this lumber yard. And one of the th considerations is once you're free, then what? Mm. Mm. So they had the foresight to say, you know what? We can't just help people to freedom, but we need to also provide jobs so that people can have, you know, a sustainable lifestyle. And so um, the two of them created jobs and they had um, enslavers coming to the lumber yard, shooting out and making threats to take different people, but it didn't stop them from doing their business. Now, William Whipper's house was uniquely placed at the end of uh, a bridge in Columbia, Pennsylvania. And a lot of people, once they cross that bridge, um, it's like kind of in the uh, Lancaster area. Okay. Once they crossed that bridge, they would get to his house. It was literally right there. So he said like at night, he would help many people off to freedom. So he did one of two things. One, he either put them on a boat and sent them west to Pittsburgh, or he put them on his cars because he had a railroad as well. Let me back up. His railroad system was called the um, Columbia Philadelphia Railroad. So this brother had his own transportation and he would transport the lumber, but he also would transport passengers. And in some of those passenger cars, there were secret compartments. And in those secret compartments that nobody else could see or detect were freedom seekers. They're mm. standing upright mm. with a little crack to breathe. Mm. Wow. And they would get to this point. Now you can go to um, Fairmount Park in Philadelphia and you can see um, what's called the inclined plane. There was a portion of this, um, this like kind of like a little inlet where they had to lower the, the train, the train car, but they had to unload it first um, because it was run by horses at that time. So it was just the freight was too heavy down the hill. So what they ended up having to do was to unload. And that was the freedom seekers opportunity and their only opportunity before the stop where the patrollers were mm -hmm. to get off. So you figure you've been sometimes riding for 10 hours, jostling up and down, standing upright. And you may have children that you've got to get off and not just yourself. And mm -hmm. it's dark. It's dark. Mm -hmm. And you got to get off. Um, so William Whipper, was not only um, a wealthy businessman who created jobs, but he also was an underground conductor. And um, he really just risked his life and his wealth, you know, his, his fortune for his family. He risked his freedom for the sake of other people's freedom. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Go ahead, Kai. No, I'm just taking this all in and um, it's just so beautiful to hear the stories of um, our heroes that we don't hear about. Um, and I think um, Dee, you has said that like, this is an opportunity for you to bring up names to people when you're doing these tours and to share with them other people that were a part of our rich history and helping us on the road to freedom. And um, it's just the risk that um, so many of our ancestors, um, ones that were free, that were accomplished, like this gentleman, that risked right. all of that for others. And it's something that, um, it, it does, I'm sure it does happen now, <laughs> where members of our community do uh, risk maybe um, employment opportunity or ability to move up the corporate ladder because they have spoken out against something that is taking place as it relates to race and, and the company in that they work. Um, and so just seeing this, it just shows that um, what this man represents and others that we're gonna talk about tonight, that they are still with us. This is the type of blood that flows through our veins. Um, and this is the type of people that we are, regardless of kind of what we're seeing right now, <laughs> kind of display on mainstream news is this is actually who we are, that we can be a people that are serious, um, committed to our community. Um, and I guess you could say on code. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just taking all of this in because this is something that we don't really talk about too much or hear about. Um, and these are our heroes. So I, I just, I'm just taking it all in. So I'm enjoying our conversation tonight. 
I think the other component too was the ability to partner with other people, right? Like now, mm -hmm. sometimes I think, I feel like in this day and age, people are so single-minded mm -hmm. and, yes. you know, we really need to be linking and connecting more with other like-minded people because we could be, you know, a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And so William Whipper partnered with William Goodridge, who was another free African-American who was wealthy. And guess what? He also had a railroad that connected with his railroad. So you could literally go from William to William to William. So you had William Goodridge, William Whipper, <laughs> William Still, and all three of them well-established homeowners, landowners, business owners, helping the community. And in addition to that, with with this, uh, with William Whipper, he also uh, co-founded the American Moral Reform Society, which was an earliest, uh, uh, which was a one of the, not one of the very first, but was was one of the earlier um, uh, abolitionist society organizations in the United States. And so, to her point, this um, collaborating with each other was so important for this uh, operation to work. And uh, we had to be the head of what these different societies, secret societies and things like that uh, looked like because uh, nobody knows us better than us, right? Uh, no one can speak the language that we speak. No one can um, walk like we walk, talk like we walk, all these things that we know in code gives us the, uh, bout, uh, the, uh, uh, the boat of confidence to say that this person's okay and I'm going to be taken care of. Right. The, 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 the interesting thing when Dee was talking is about just the intentionality uh, about these individuals, but also, you know, there was a statistic that came out a few years ago that said 95% of black businesses today are uh, sold or are, are operated by one person. Mm -hmm. and so they're so, sole proprietor. And so hearing black men and black women in those times creating businesses to work to other people um to, and not just other black people just other people in general in the community that these guys were business leaders they were economic leaders i mean look this brother had a railroad okay <laughs> like, like let's be clear like he had his own route and so that just gives um you know dr francis crest wilson she's one of my favorite people on the planet but she always says to be encouraged and another thing she always says was, she talked about the story like, black people today, we can learn from our past because, and you talked about this earlier, the only way that messages would get around was word of mouth. You didn't have cell phones. So a lot of times there might've been a circle of 20 or 30 people and one person was there teaching people how to read. And so that literally removes the excuses from the community, uh, from our children and relationships and everything of that nature when you start to look at the previous circumstances um, that our ancestors had. So this is fascinating, constructive information. Shout out to William Whipper, man. Shout yeah. out to old Willie. Shout out to Willie. <laughs> Willie was back then, didn't it? <laughs> so I know we got James Forden, and then uh, Frederick wants to talk about some of these fantastic communities yeah. that came from and originated from, from, from these gentlemen. So if you want to go ahead and talk about Mr. Forden, Miss D, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so James Fortin, his story is interesting because he was born in the 1700s. And um, as a little boy, eight years old, he was in the Revolutionary War as a powder boy. And he was wow. captured on a ship and he found favor with the captain so much that he was willing to let him go free. But he made the choice at eight years old. No, I'm going to stay with my people and I'm going to stand for I'm going to stand for the cause. So eventually he went back, um, you know, to Philadelphia and he learned to trade. And ultimately he ends up um, forming this sale making company. And it takes off because he's making it in a way that nobody else is. He's experimenting with these different ways to do it. And he began to develop all of this wealth. You said, he, you said sale, like, like sale. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure the audience knew what she was talking about. Okay. Yes, cool. thank you for that. Yep, the ship sale. Um, and so that was, you know, his primary business and what got him started. But what I love about him was that he didn't keep that wealth to himself. He set up his family to have generational wealth. And um, his three daughters, along with his wife, 
founded um, up to at least six anti-slavery committees during the time of slavery. Um, two of those daughters were Underground Railroad conductors. Mm. One of them, uh, Charlotte, uh, I'm sorry, Harriet. Harriet married Robert Purvis. And I like to say he looks Caucasian because a lot of people are like, oh, Robert, Pur Robert Purvis was white. He was not, like I could tell you the history of his parents, but we probably don't have time for that. But he was black, so... <laughs> OK. And he advocated for a lot of um, a lot of rights for African-American people. And so the two of them did a lot um, in terms of setting up organizations. Um, they, they set up a subscription that mailed books to black homes. Um, people could sign up. Um, they set up sp uh, spaces for people to come and to speak publicly. Uh, they just did all kinds of things. But um, you asked before about what do you do like in the climate where people have a problem with what you're doing? Mm -hmm. They could not stand the Purvis people, the, the rioters, the people who were pro-slavery and they took it to the extreme. There was a big riot because of Jamaica um, Emancipation Day. And it was three days of, of looting and rioting and um, attacking churches and homes. But the Purvis family was targeted and they were targeted so hard that a priest actually came and stood in between their house and the mob that was threatening to set the house on fire. The Purvis family decided because they had eight children that they were going to go ahead and relocate because you know, when you have babies, you don't want anything happening to your kids, but it didn't stop them and it didn't intimidate them from doing the work. Hmm. In fact, when they got their new home, which was just on the outskirts of the city, they expanded their underground work. And there's a landmark sign up today that states that they helped 9,000 people. Mm. Wow. Wow, 9,000, not 90, 9,000 9, people, wow. And that, that is the highest number I've ever seen. I'm not saying it is the highest, but the highest right. that I've ever seen for any underground conductor, and again, Wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. Yeah. Economic funding. When we say money don't matter, no, 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 no. Every political or every revolution has to be funded by somebody. So shout out to the Purpose family and, and all the people that they collaborated with. What you got, Mr. Murphy, in reference to some additional information? Yeah, man. So, you know, in, in moving past um, all of the greatness that individuals along the Underground Railroad, as well as uh, various different uh, other abolitionists, uh, freedom seekers who decided to just take the freedom within their own uh, selves uh, without actually using the Underground Railroad, because you had some individuals that did that as well, who escaped right. across uh, enemy lines, uh, well, uh, who escaped, escaped to union uh, lines in order to fight for their freedom. Um, after emancipation, you know, we quickly moved into reconstruction, which uh, I think if my years are right, ended in 1877, right? Yeah. So you had this period in where um, the United States was more intentional about making sure that there was some sense of equity that was there. Um, now, prior to that, because I always throw this dig in when we talk about reparations, uh, former enslavers receive reparations up yes. to hundred dollars for their enslaved individuals. So we cannot forget that, right? Literally so many other different um, uh, uh, racial groups. And, and I always use air quotes with races because we know it's a construct. It's not something that's based in real, right? Um, they receive these, right? <laughs> and, and, and Lincoln is the one who signed it. Right. So that's why with some historians and, and some folks, you know, it's just kind of like this love hate thing because it's like, yeah, but right. <laughs> so we have to be cognizant of that. But the Reconstruction era was probably one of the most progressive eras during uh, that time period. Right. Uh, you had black and white folks working side by side on farms. Black folks were opening up businesses. They were riding these different trolleys and things like that together. And it was actually in Memphis, Ida B. Wells, due to the lynchings, and obviously, you know, she was a very big crusader on the anti-lynching uh, mm -hmm. campaign. Um, there was a business owner in downtown Memphis 
uh, because the black folks were striking, right? So this is before the bus, right? Uh, not um, to not utilize the trolley because they weren't being treated equitably, right? Uh, and so because of that, they were begging Ida B. Wells to, hey, get your people to ride these these trolleys. You know, our businesses are hurting, right? Like we need you. And she right. was like, no, not until they get access, right? She just, she, she wasn't doing it, which is one of the multiple reasons of which why she was ran out of Memphis, you know? Uh, and of course she ended up in Chicago. And so uh, we had this moment also where we had so many people that were involved in politics. And I'm talking black folks, y'all. You can't be dumb and, and be in politics, right? And that was the narrative that was spun off of folks coming out, out, out of the institutional slavery that you can't read, you can't write, you can't do this, you can't do that. But that was a lie. So many brothers and sisters um, snuck and, and learned how to do all these things because y'all know we can be sneaky and do what it is that we need to do to our desired outcome. And we do it all the time. And so we talk about like House of Representatives, um, Alexander Curtis, who was down in Alabama, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of James Bish, uh, B-I-S-H, and he was uh, Illinois House of Representatives. And then there was a brother that was named George L Lowther, uh, and he was also involved uh, in uh, the Massachusetts uh, House of Representatives as well. Right. So you have so many people that were involved in politics that had the ability to create a sense of um, uh, representation hope, right, that, wow, these little kids are actually seeing Black folks in these high positions that are creating positive change for various different communities. Now, that's until the haters start hating, right? And there are so many different uh, elements of the Klan, right? Um, there were numerous time periods in which they kept popping up and resurging. Uh, and then also there were groups that were called the Red Coats, as well. Um, and, and so I'm sorry, red shirts, not red coats, red shirts. Uh, and when we talk about Wilmington, which was one of the most prosperous cities in the South, where you had white folks coming up to black folks in the 1800s, late 1800s, 1898, getting loans. Um, they were going to black dentists. They were going to black physicians, et cetera, et cetera. And we all know what happened in Wilmington. They burnt the town. The first successful coup happened. They took over the local government. And not one person served a, a day in jail. And so what does that do? That teaches people how, uh, across the rest of the country, how right. to treat Black folks. Yeah. Right. If we can come in here, burn down this very prosperous city that is, uh, uh, is prospering because of Black folks, right? Uh, we're literally coming to them to receive services. Then we can get away with anything. Right. And that's exactly what happened in Wilmington. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, named Chris Miller uh, directed the film Fire. Yeah. I advise everybody to check that out. Part two is going to be coming out here pretty soon. Great movie, right? Uh, part two is going to be coming out here pretty soon. And so after that happened, Black folks had to, we had to get it back together, right? Like we always have these moments where we get knocked down and we got to get back up and get it back together. And we do. And so there was various different, and, and there were multiple different Black Wall Streets. I won't talk about Tulsa because so many people understand and know about Tulsa. Right. right. But um, through my travels with history before us and interviewing descendants and people in various different places, I picked out a couple of, of neighborhoods. One of them is Jackson Ward in Richmond, Virginia, which was a very prominent African-American uh, space in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and a lot of that was due to Maggie Lena Walker, who was a rock star entrepreneur in 1903. She was the first African-American woman to charter and was the president of a bank. OK, 1903. Now, her mother was enslaved and her father was a, a was an Irishman. I think he was he was a white Irishman. Um, but she created this um, financial literacy um, component to the area, um, invested in so many businesses. And uh, if you ever go to Richmond, Virginia, please tour her home. You walk in, it smells like money, <laughs> right? Like it smells like money, for real. Uh, and there's actually a safe, one of the original safes that 
that is in her house on, on the second floor. And anybody who's everybody in the African American community uh, in the early 1900s, 18, late 1800s, uh, who were born or were formerly enslaved, have been to this place. Um, she has um, such a long standing effect in that community, even still to this day. There is a, um, a monument that's out there for her as well. Uh, her um, home is on the national, it's, it's a national parks. Uh, site and it, it's it's really really great. Now, what happened is similar to Greenwood. It provided a comprehensive view of what a thriving black community looked like. Right, everything that was there, you know, self sustainable. You didn't need to go out, right? You didn't need to go into the throes of what danger could look like in white neighborhoods because you had everything there. But after World War II, it was a sharp decline, and a lot of that was due to what we all know as redlining where industry started coming in, uh, highways being built in various different places, in particular, our neighborhoods, which, of course, you know, when you do that, you affect the commerce. Absolutely. When you do that, it's very intentional. It is very, it's, it's a threat on your, in your, your community's humanity, right? Because if you take that piece away, then you're splitting up families and you're creating division. And that's what happened in that space, just like it does in so many different spaces, right? Uh, and so from there, we, we, we're going to move on up to the Midwest, and we'll talk about Bronzeville, and that's in Chicago. And it was also called, like, it was called the Black Metropolis and uh, the Black Belt, right? And what a lot of people may not understand is that a lot of these folks that are going up to the Midwest, of course, are part of the Great Migration. You will see similar neighborhoods in the South in the Midwest as well. Why? Right. Because guess who is uh, uh, now living in the Midwest? It's black folks. And they're bringing their traditions and everything up to uh, the Midwest. And so when we talk about Bronzeville, which was the Mecca for black folks, it's like, it's like the, it was like the Harlem in, Harlem in New York back then, as far as entertainment, businesses, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it created a group of various different eclectic minds, most from the South, uh, and, and we know, listen, if you got roots in Mississippi and Chicago, then you mostly got roots in Mississippi, Alabama or Tennessee. You ask people in Chicago where their southern roots, they're going to go back to those states. You know what I'm saying? And that's just that's just what it is. Um, there was a brother by the name of Binga Bank. Uh, I'm sorry. Binga Bank was Chicago's first black owned uh, life insurance rea uh, 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 realtors as well as a financial financial institution that was founded by a brother named Jesse Binga. Okay. And that's how powerful uh, Bronzeville was. And not only that, but you had a lot of entertainers, a lot of uh, civil rights activists, et cetera, et cetera, that were uh, uh, attracted to Bronzeville because of how it was able to self-govern itself and create economic prowess. So you had the likes of Ida B. Wells who moved there. After they burnt down her businesses in Memphis and threatened her life, uh, she, she went to Chicago. Uh, you had Brother Andrew Foster, who was very uh, prominent, a very prominent businessman uh, in Indianapolis. So he, he, he was over there. Bessie Coleman, uh, Louis Armstrong, and so many more. We know all the blues players that left the South and came up to Chicago. And where would they go? They would go right there to Bronzeville, right? Uh, and so that was a very, very important place that, again, mirrored uh, um, various different places throughout the South, as well as the Midwest, i.e. Uh, Tulsa, right? Um, and keep in mind that with Tulsa, Oklahoma had the most uh, historically Black towns, right? And so... They created their own commerce within their own space uh, because of um, uh, how black the state was in various different pockets, right? And so when we talk about that, you're you're gathering or or you're starting to attract so many people from uh, across the country to come to this, these places, absolutely. And if it's able to be condensed in a small space to where you have all these historically black towns, then you're able to lean on each other. You're able to trade, barter, do whatever it is that you need to do with each other. Wow. But I tell people this all the time. Black folk, there wasn't a port for black folks to, to, to get off 
and, and be in Oklahoma. When we talk about the Trail of Tears, people that are not included on the Trail of Tears leaving the east part of the country to Oklahoma were because the five civilized tribes also brought their enslaved individuals with them. So you talk about the freedmen, that's who a lot of these people are. Wow. Okay. They're not shipping people from Charleston or uh or Virginia. Right. And saying, yeah, we're gonna, that just it's not just not what happened. And slavery in Indian country didn't end until 1866, almost a full year after it ended in the lower, you know, you know, in, in the, at the rest of the United States. Right. And so these black folks um is uh, they created community out of that, right? In the state of Oklahoma. Um, and so then we moved to, to, to Birmingham, uh, the fourth district, fourth Avenue district is what it was called. And it was also known as Little Harlem. It was known as Little Harlem because again, these folks are seeing what's happening in these different places and they're mirroring it. It's just on a smaller scale. You know, Birmingham, yeah. not, it's not a Harlem, right? But there right. are a lot of components that are there uh, to it, in which people are, are feeling that energy, the art scene, the music, et cetera, et cetera, creating their own way. And um, that specific district was designed by black architects, uh, construction companies. Um, uh, there were um, there's a bank that was there that was called the Penny Savings Bank as well. Right. And so we created so many self-sustaining communities across right. the country that right. so many people don't know about. Uh, that if you just uh, take a deep dive into history from a comprehensive standpoint, um, uh, go outside of your own community and, and see that, you know what, this is something that was national. And just how people talked on the Underground Railroad, you better believe that they were talking from state to state uh, well after, uh, uh, you know, emancipation or after emancipation to say, hey, I got a cousin that is going to be coming there to Chicago. Right. They need a place to stay. They're not going to stop on the way from Alabama, because Lord knows what can happen, right? Um, and, and and so make sure you take care of them, right? And that's where the Green Book came about as well. The Green Book and all these different type of communications is a spawn of the Underground Railroad. It's Black folks communicating with each other in the spirit of creating safe space, right? And so we know about uh, uh, the Black Wall Street in, in Oklahoma, um, a lot of people are familiar with Black Wall Street in Durham as well. I'm in Charlotte, so I'm right up the street from it. But there are a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of places in the United States. West Oakland has one. Uh, I think it's called West 7th, Ave 7th Avenue. Um, Houston, uh, Dallas, like so many different places had these different corridors that were full of Black folks, full of money, full of prosperity, full of home, home ownership, uh, and uh, unfortunately, where you see a highway, you can probably bet that that's where that community was. And a lot of things, unfortunately, had to dissolve. Right. <clears throat> Man, when you say all of that, and the first thing you ended it probably, unfortunately, the, the right way, though, is that all these communities had the same, and I, I call it, building a highway to me is, is direct violence. Because you are, because you are economically depriving and assaulting a community's core, which is the ability for people to work. And so all these communities all across the country, and you mentioned all these states, you didn't just say East Coast, you're talking on the West Coast, Midwest, South, things of that nature. All these cities were terrorized in the same way. Yep. And so, but the one thing that, that I found fascinating when you guys were talking was all these black people, men and women, were there was no confusion about what we're doing. We are doing this for our group, period. And they were specific about doing this for our group. If other people were helped in that process, fantastic, but they were very unapologetic. This is for black people, this is for our group, this is for men, this is for women, this is for children, this is for families. Everybody was integrated. This is something we talked about, guys. For our listeners, everybody was integrated until this process. There was no separation. 
Black men were helping black women, black women were helping black men, and families were being helped as well. So there's a lot of lessons yeah. that we can take from this. And you guys have been phenomenal. Um, because obviously this is a conversation we can have forever, to be yeah. told. <laughs> um, but but obviously we just hit the hour mark and we don't want to take up too much of your time. I know that Fred just got back from partying. Um <laughs> hey, I'm a, the name of that movie is Wilmington on Fire. Yeah. You can find it on Amazon Prime and also on Amazon as well. It's a fantastic documentary. Please check it out. Please check it out. But um, if you guys want to um, start with uh, Conductor D, something you want to leave us with or leave the people with that um, some some encouraging words or just something that they can take from in, in history. And because before you say that, my lady and I, we have a hat. And I would encourage Black people we, we have other people that watch this broadcast, shout out to everybody else, but I encourage black people, when you go to a town, look for the black history in the town. We do this all the time, and every time we find something, it is fascinating about what the people were doing in those towns, how constructive they were, how intentional they were, and how unified they are. So I just want to make sure I said that. If you guys are traveling, I don't care what the city is. There's some level of black history there that you can learn from. Go ahead, Dee. Yes. So I'll echo what you said. Um, <laughs> give, give voice to those untold stories. Absolutely. Because the stories that should be taught with authenticity and wholeness are not taught. Okay. And so we have to teach ourselves and share that information that we know with other people. And so if you'd like to follow me on Instagram or Facebook, it's at UGR3Day. Um, I sell, share stories um, every day, um, those untold stories. So do that. Invest in yourselves without excuses. Invest in other people. Take the time to empower and encourage and connect. Fantastic. Mr. Murphy. Yeah, you know, echo in the same sentiments. Um, and, and I encourage individuals to use uh, use this, right? Use your cell phones, man. Like we have to be so intentional and so inquisitive about our people, especially due to the fact that the only thing that's really going up now for us are historical markers, which I have no knock against that. I erected five of them this year in my hometown, but our buildings are going along the wayside. Our neighborhoods are getting knocked down. So many things are just leaving. And the only thing that we're going to really have left, and I hate to say this, uh, but to a large degree, is oral histories. So mm -hmm. you don't have to be a film uh, expert. Uh, our phones, cameras are well enough. Our uh, audio, uh, the recorders on our phone is well enough. Seek elders in the community. Seek young folks. Seek historians in the communities that have the knowledge that you need to present on whatever platform you have our beautiful, rich history. Our history, and this is my personal opinion, and I mean black folks that are here in this in these United States is unmatched, mm. period. It's unmatched. And if we aren't the gatekeepers for that, then things will leave us, right? They will leave us and our kids and even ourselves need to consistently be fed this soul food in which we've talked about tonight in right. order to keep up with the good fight. You can find me at History Before Us on Instagram, as well as on Facebook and Twitter. That's where you'll find uh, some of my uh, documentary work. And, and like D, we both post and stuff on a daily basis uh, and, and love collaborating. So I appreciate this opportunity and uh, wish everyone, uh, you know, well wishes throughout the rest of the year. Kai, what you got? <laughs> yeah. So again, thank you. Um, thank you both for coming on and, and sharing this with us. I'm so happy that Aaron introduced me to your work. Um, so now I'll be following you on social media. So those that are listening, you can find um, the social media information is right in the chat. And I also will add it in the description of this video after the broadcast. So that way you'll be able to access it there as well. Um, and so uh, just make sure that you support the work and please share this video, like this video. Um, this is one way that we can begin to spread information about our history through having conversations such as this. So definitely give this video a share. 
Resilience, resilience, resilience. You guys are awesome. Conductor D, Mr. Murphy. All I'm gonna say is I'm gonna keep it real. We need some more. We need some modern day William Whippers. We yeah. need some modern day Fordens. We need some I we need sisters. We need some Idas out there. Uh, we need some Miss Walkers down in Richmond. Hey, yeah. this is all hands on deck. But like Dr. Welsing says, be encouraged. Hey, if you guys like this video, smash, subscribe, share it with your friend. I bet you can share it with your grandma. Uh, she'll probably know some of these people that we've been talking about too. So even your parents. But um, appreciate everybody tuning in. Smash that like button. The third podcast again. Thank you to Mr. Murphy. Thank you to Conductor D, Kai, myself, and Brandon. Appreciate you guys, and we're out. Peace. Peace.